Tonight, the deadly surge, flu cases skyrocketing in all corners of the country. Hospitals pushed to their limits. In some cases, four out of every five beds full. Cases of the flu at their highest level in more than a decade, nearly doubling over the last week. Two doctors battling this outbreak on the front lines. Join us live in just moments. Also breaking, the top secret storage? The latest bombshell development involving former President Donald Trump's handling of sensitive government material. Two documents reportedly marked classified found at a storage site near Mar-a-Lago. The new reporting coming in at this hour. Failure to launch, Herschel Walker soundly defeated in Georgia. Just the latest Trump-backed candidate to falter in the midterms. Mitt Romney calling an endorsement from the former president the, quote, kiss of death, what it all means for Trump's own bid for re-election in 2024. Overseas stopping the coup, the massive sting operation in Germany. Police raiding homes all across the country, arresting 25 far-right extremists for plotting to violently overthrow the government. The building those armed suspects were training to storm. And Peru spiraling into political chaos tonight. The president impeached and detained by police after he threatened to dissolve the government entirely. The new leader stepping in with the future of democracy in the South American nation on the line. Plus, air tag stalking fears. The new class action lawsuit just filed. Why two women are claiming the Apple devices enabled their exes to stalk and harass them. The tips tonight on how to use those tiny tracking devices safely. And homecoming hug, the heartwarming moment this mascot revealed his true identity and gave his little girl the embrace she had been waiting for months. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. We begin tonight with that deadly flu outbreak sweeping through the nation. More than 8.7 million Americans infected as cases of the flu return this year with a vengeance. Take a look at this map. Come over here. The red and orange you see here are areas where there is a very high or high risk of contracting the flu. Those colors covering almost all of the map. And this flu season hitting much harder, but also much earlier than usual. You can see just how rapidly hospitalizations climbed this year compared to years past. Look at the levels for 2022 all the way in November already rising at pharmacies across the country. These empty shelves tell you everything you need to know, right? Many states running low on Tamiflu and over the counter cold and flu medicines. And part of what is driving this particularly dangerous season, experts say, is vaccine fatigue, as we've been telling you about here on top story. Compared to the same time last year, look at this, 2.4 million fewer shots have been administered. And of course, all of this just adding to the strain already caused by cases of COVID and RSV. Tom Costello leads us off with more on this triple threat. Early December and hospitals nationwide are once again at full capacity with a trifecta of illness, COVID, the RSV virus, and a flu season that started six weeks early. Flu hospitalizations now running at a decade high with 79% of hospital beds occupied. We need people to be sure to stay home when you're sick. Nationwide, at least 4,500 flu deaths just since October 1st. Why the surge? Infectious disease experts say after several years of pandemic isolation, most Americans are back at school, work, gathering indoors with others and traveling. Some exposed to viruses for the first time in two plus years. Our immune systems are just fine. They were ready and waiting. They just hadn't been exposed to the virus. This has been an exposure deficit. So much flu, some pharmacies are running low on flu medication. This so-called triple-demic, as the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, prepares to leave his post. In a one-on-one -on -one interview with nightly news anchor Lester Holt, Fauci is urging Americans to quickly get a flu vaccine and a COVID booster. And he's not afraid to return to masking in some cases. And I'm not talking about mandating anything. I'm talking about just common sense of saying, you know, I really don't want to take the risk of myself getting infected and even more so spreading it to someone who's a vulnerable member of my family or someone that I know. The CDC reports the flu vaccination rates are running well below what they were doing before the pandemic. And the reason may be vaccine fatigue. People are tired after getting so many COVID shots and now flu season. And yet flu kills. The CDC is again suggesting wear a mask to protect against all respiratory illnesses, especially if you're traveling or if you are immunocompromised. Tom. 
Okay, Tom Costello leading us off tonight. Tom, we thank you for that. For more on what's going on inside those hospitals, I want to bring in two people on the front lines. Dr. Rob Davidson, an ER physician in West Michigan, and Dr. Michael Cuba, Systems Chair of Emergency Medicine at Oxner Health System in Louisiana. Dr. Cuba, thanks so much for joining us. I want to start with you. Take us into the ER tonight there in New Orleans. What are you seeing when it comes to the flu? We are seeing a... a really good spike, a rapid increase in flu cases for sure. Um, it's all influenza A. Um, and we are, when I interview my patients, it's frequently they haven't been vaccinated. I, I do see that uh, vaccination fatigue and a, a lack of people being vaccinated for sure. Dr. Cuba, how do people get so bad that they end up in the hospital with the flu? A lot of times it's uh, after the influenza, then you have like other infections like post-influenza pneumonia. And so you have lung infections after you've had influenza and your body's kind of beat down from the virus. And of course that typically happens in our, our more uh, uh, fragile patients, uh, elderly or the very young, but that's what I've seen most of the time the patients that have to be admitted to the hospital. But luckily we haven't seen a lot of the ICU admits, it's just the admits to the hospital, which are still very important. Dr. Dangerous. Davidson, what do, you, what do you attribute all this to? We heard a little mm -hmm. bit about the, the vaccine fatigue. We reported that, we just heard it there from Dr. Cuba. Is there also something going on just with, with our, our immunity? Is it because we've been separated, we've been wearing masks for so many years that maybe our bodies aren't as strong as they used to be? No, I think our immune systems are, are, are ready, are able to fight these viruses. Really, I know in my rural county, COVID vaccine uptake was only about 50%, and flu vaccines are at about 70% of where they were before the pandemic. And we're not seeing a huge spike yet, but we're seeing numbers 60% this week over last week. Our hospitals are already full. We already are holding people in the ER, in my little rural ER, to be transferred or to be admitted for days on end. And so, you know, as a so what do you what do you flu, think it is? You think you think it's purely because of the vaccine? I think that's a lot of it. I also think just people getting back to being together, being amongst others and, you know, not wanting to stay away when they're sick. They want to get back into life and enjoy the things they want to do. Dr. Cuba, give us some some best practices now as, as we're entering this sort of triple demic here. Right. What should people look out for? What are some of the symptoms of the flu they should be aware of? Um, well, the fever, uh, cough, shortness of breath, it can be GI issues as well, like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, but a lot of body aches and low-grade temperatures are, 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 are commonly what we see. And then, Dr. Cuba, how do you make the decision of, of whether to get medicine or whether to go to the ER? How do you make that decision? Well, most influenza can be treated at home. It's just a virus like a lot of the other viruses we deal with, and fever control, making sure your loved ones stay hydrated uh, will be probably carry the day most of the times. But sometimes when the fevers get out of control, intractable vomiting, uh, when you get, become more increased shortness of breath and things like that, it could be signs that things are getting a little bit worse and you might have uh, uh, need to be evaluated by a physician or go to the emergency department. Dr. Davidson, I know this may sound like a, a very silly question, but I, I think it's always important to keep it very simple and remind our viewers on how to do things. Where, where can you get your flu shots? Where can you get your flu tests? Yeah, you can get your flu test through your doctor's office. You know, they can order those. It's certainly in the ER, we do flu tests. As far as your flu shot, really through your doctor's office, through your local health department. Many hospital systems will set up flu shot, you know, fairs where people can get them. And it's not too late to get them. Uh, flu often peaks in January and February, more commonly than December. So um, we don't know if this is the peak. You don't know until it's past you. Uh, finally, Dr. Q, but with the rise of COVID, we're now talking about the triple demic. Should, should Americans be ready for sort of these, these intense seasons of sickness in, in the era of COVID? Well, it has uh, probably yet to be determined, uh, as you just mentioned. You know, COVID, we're seeing a, a smoldering, uh, maybe slight increase in our numbers of that. Hopefully, we might even see a little bit of a peak already of RSV, I'm fingers crossed, but... Um, you know, I'm worried with the with the holidays coming up and Christmas and travel and people, again, wanting to be with loved ones and taking viruses from one side of the country to the other that we might, we're not out of the woods and it's going to probably get worse before it gets better. Dr. Cuba, Dr. Davidson, we thank you so much. We know you guys are busy seeing patients and working all day, so we appreciate you taking the time to join Top Story tonight. We want to move on now to that other major headline overseas out of Germany, where authorities say they have stopped a plot to get this, overthrow the government there. More than two dozen people rounded up in raids there today. Authorities say their failed coup attempt was fueled by conspiracy theories. NBC's Kelly Kobieya has more. 
up. In early morning raids across Germany, thousands of police officers at more than 100 locations arrested 25 people. Authorities say they were planning a violent overthrow of the German government in a far-right extremist plot. Prosecutors say the suspects had acquired weapons, organized weapons training, and intended to storm the German parliament building. The suspects are followers of conspiracy myths, including QAnon, this federal prosecutor said. He said the arrested suspects, primarily German nationals, but also including one Russian national, formed a shadow government to put in place should they succeed in overthrowing the German government, which they believed was run by a so-called deep state. Among those arrested, a suspected ringleader from a historic royal family, as well as German military veterans. Germany's interior minister said the depths of the organization's structure remains under investigation. The group had a political and military arm, she said, showing the danger of this suspected terrorist organization. Arrests were made across Germany, as well as one each in Austria and Italy. Some suspects making their first court appearance today in the wake of one of the biggest counterterrorism operations in German history. Kelly Kobiella, NBC News. Okay, sticking with international headlines now, we head to the Americas and the escalating political crisis in Peru. Lawmakers there have voted to oust the president, Pedro Castillo, after he tried to dissolve the country's Congress and install an emergency government. Tonight, he's under arrest for violating the Constitution. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has the latest. Tonight, Peru's democracy is on the brink after a day of political chaos. It began with President Pedro Castillo trying to dissolve Peru's Congress and install an emergency government. That prompted a string of cabinet resignations and international condemnation. The U.S. ambassador urging Castillo to reverse his attempt to shut down Congress and allow Peru's democratic institutions to function according to the Constitution. Hours later, Congress began its session with lawmakers singing the national anthem, later voting to impeach Castillo and announcing that Vice President Dina Boluarte would be the new leader of Peru. This afternoon, she was sworn in, the first woman to reach the presidency in Peru's more than 200 years as an independent republic. Late today, the national police tweeted out a photo of Castillo being detained. It was a threat to democracy, but... But in fact, democracy won out, the Constitution won out, um, because none of the institutions that he would have needed to govern as a dictator were going to support him. His ouster coming after years of political crises. Narrowly elected in July of 2021, Castillo's administration had been chaotic, with dozens of ministers appointed, replaced, or resigned in little over a year. The former school teacher from rural Peru had survived two previous impeachment attempts. According to polls, his popularity had even risen slightly. But he's also faced a slew of corruption investigations, looking into whether he used his position to benefit himself, his family, and close allies. He's repeatedly denied all the allegations against him and blasted his critics, saying they intend to blow up democracy and disregard our people's right to choose. Although Castillo is Peru's first president to be investigated while still in office, nearly every former president in the last 40 years have been charged with corruption. I think there's a message here also that whether it's left or whether it's right wing, corruption is something people are fed up with also. And President Castillo, he promised to clean up things and, and rule against the elite and not rob from the till. And evidence is building up that, in fact, he and his uh, inner circle did just that. And I think the message here is the public doesn't want to see that and doesn't want to, doesn't tolerate that. An international summit that was scheduled to be held next week in Lima has now been postponed amid the political turmoil. Tom? All right, Gabe Gutierrez tracking all those developments out of Peru. Back here at home, a bombshell new development when it comes to former President Donald Trump and his battle with the Justice Department. Two documents marked classified found in a federal storage facility containing Trump's possessions. This discovery part of a voluntary search conducted by the former president's lawyers at various Trump-linked properties. Sources confirming to NBC News those documents have been turned over to the FBI. I want to bring in NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian, who joins us tonight. So, Ken, walk us through this. It's been reported that these documents were found 
after the former president's team searched his own properties for any classified material still in his possession. What more do we know about these documents and how they were found? Tom, we're told they were found at a storage facility run by the federal government in a box that was taken there from the Trump White House. And one source told us that Donald Trump had never actually been to that facility or opened that box. And we're told there were two documents with classified markings, unclear at what level of classification, and that when Trump's lawyers discovered them, they turned them over to the FBI. So what this underscores, though, Tom, is that once again, more evidence that the Trump team did not comply with a grand jury subpoena they received in May asking them, demanding that they turn over all documents with classification markings. Ken, I guess this leads to the next question. I know you're not a defense attorney, but, but doesn't the former president's case immediately crumble? I mean, even though it's his own team who's turning over the documents, clearly he still had classified documents. Absolutely. And other people have gone to prison for less, Tom. Uh, that's why many legal experts say this case is ripe for charging Donald Trump. Uh, others say, though, that this question of obstruction of justice really needs to, to be solved. They, they need to get to the bottom of that, that it doesn't make sense to charge a former president with a simple document mishandling case, because after all, he once had access to these classified documents. But if there's evidence that he actively obstructed, that he instructed people not to turn these documents over out of stubbornness or for any other the reason, then that becomes a much more serious matter, Tom. Okay, Ken Delanian for us tonight on that breaking news. Ken, we thank you for that. Staking, sticking with politics now in a major victory in Georgia for Democrats. Incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock hanging on to his seat, defeating embattled Republican candidate Herschel Walker. Warnock celebrating the victory in a speech last night. After a hard-fought campaign, you got me for six more years. Democrats now holding 51 seats in the chamber, meaning they'll no longer rely on Vice President Kamala Harris to serve as their tiebreaker this midterm cycle, officially the first time the sitting president's party hasn't lost a Senate seat since 1934. Many of those key midterm contests viewed as a referendum on former President Trump with some moderate Republican voters across the country voting for Democrats. The former president also stumbling in recent days with calls to, quote, terminate the Constitution and, of course, his high-profile dinner with a white supremacist. So what does this mean for the Trump campaign as it gears up for 2024? I want to bring in one of our NBC News political analysts right now, Republican strategist Susan Del Percio. So, Susan, I want to start with some of the strong words from uh, Senator Mitt Romney. I'm not sure if you've seen this or not. I want to uh, play it right now for our viewers. Well, President Trump lost again. Uh, and I know a lot of people in our party uh, love the president, former president, but he's, uh, if you will, the kiss of death for somebody who wants to win a general election. And at some point, we've got to move on and, and look for new leaders that will uh, lead us to win and to be able to get an agenda that, frankly, President Trump would find an attractive agenda, have that agenda be successful. So, spoiler alert, Senator Romney obviously never had a great relationship with the former president. Uh, but, but is what he's saying true? Absolutely. There's no question that Donald Trump is toxic. Let's not forget the leading contender for the Republican nomination for president, the only one running, Donald Trump, was not invited to Georgia to campaign. Yeah. In the final days, right? In the right. final days. That's crazy. That's when, because it's all about a turnout vote. And what the Republicans on the ground were concerned about is that Donald Trump being there would actually turn out voters against Walker. So, the fa that, that alone tells you where the reputation is right now, at least publicly and with some tight races where Donald Trump stands. He's not welcome. So the framing on this, on this story was failure to launch. It's because he's had all these hiccups, and they're worse than hiccups, right? I mean, for any other politician, they would maybe be the end of a political career. But in 2016, we also saw the former president survive his attacks on Senator John McCain survived the Access Hollywood tapes as well, and then he became the president. So my question to you is, as somebody who's, who's, who's a Republican who cares about the party, uh, are you concerned that he could still keep his 20 to 25 percent MAGA base and run the primaries? He can, absolutely, and it is of great concern because he still has a core support of voters on the ground, the grassroots, we call them. However, we start, we're starting to see some more... Uh, mainstream Republicans or just leadership come out and start to distance themselves from Trump's words, at least. So that may start making a difference. However, if all of a sudden 10, 12 viable Republican candidates jump into the fray in the presidential election, 
that leaves Trump with 25 percent and the others splitting it, it could leave Trump in a good position. We, we had one of our, our number one top story fans watching this show right now just call in. His name is Carlos Crubello. He's the former uh, Republican congressman, also an NBC News analyst. He wants to get in on this conversation. <laughs> so, Carlos, my question to you is also somebody who, who still has very close ties to the GOP. How do you prevent several Republican candidates, and, and we can list several names of people who likely will run, because it, it really benefits them even if they lose. It gets their name out there. They can write books. They can get speaking uh, fees. How do you tell those Republicans, listen, don't, don't throw your hat in the ring because then the former president could win? Well, that's right, Tom. It's good to be with you. The only way it looks like Donald Trump could get through a Republican field is if it's uh, fractured enough, if there are enough candidates like in 2016. So the big question ahead of 2024 and as we move into primary season will be, will Republicans be able to have the same discipline that Democrats had in 2020 when Joe Biden emerged after South Carolina, and all of them seem to say, OK, let's take a step back and let's uh, support Biden here so that we can win. Can Republicans have that kind of discipline when it comes to party discipline in the, in the last decade? It's been Republicans that have fallen short. So that's going to be the big test. Carlos brings up a good point. The Democrats figured this out last time around, right? Um, Joe Biden. Representative Clyburn, they, they were able to, to figure something out. He wins in South Carolina. He turns around his campaign. But but who's the voice in the Republican Party who's going to tell people like maybe Governor Chris Christie, hey, listen, don't run? Who's going to tell other people like maybe Senator Marco Rubio, don't run again if they decide to run? Right. Um, you know, the old saying was when I started in politics is that Democrats fall in love, Republicans fall in line. Yeah. But that discipline. That doesn't ha I don't know if that, that's still true. Yeah. Has completely gone with Donald Trump. Uh, being elected president in 2016. So they, there is no line. Uh, I think the best that Republicans who are looking to run for president is to go to their core big donors, start exploring the waters with them, keep it low for now, and see if there's a... See if Donald Trump also, by the way, can destroy himself in three weeks. His company has been convicted of tax fraud. I know he's faced this... Yeah, but he before. has... And, and he also, one of his strengths was that he has no shame. So why why wouldn't because he why wouldn't he, he why would he stop before Iowa because or New Hampshire? Because people are tired of him. Right. They they liked his policies. They said, but they don't want the drama. If they can get someone else, let's not forget. I I think that crowd that base can go on, on their own without Donald Trump. Donald Trump needs them more than they need. Yeah, but I but I, I think the, someone the actually has issue, to be. Tom. I think someone has to be Donald Trump. Uh, Carlos, Carlos, my next question is for you because I, I want to bring this up. This is important. Um, the GOP front runner in, in some circles, you know, next to the former president is of course Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Um, and you told the Atlantic this quote: "DeSantis has this robotic quality that he has to shed. Everything else chucks the box. He's smart and competent and committed to his ideology. He just has to." humanize himself. If it's DeSantis versus Trump, Carlos, aren't you also concerned that, that possibly the former president will take DeSantis? A lot of people here in Florida are, Tom, because Donald Trump, for all his flaws, is a guy who can be personable. Uh, he's a great host. He can even be funny sometimes. Ron DeSantis is, is very scripted. Uh, he's, he's very strong on policy. But when people run for president, that question always comes up, who would you rather have a beer with? And that's where a lot of people think Ron DeSantis could struggle. He's going to have to go to places like Iowa, New Hampshire, and do a lot of retail campaigning. So that's probably uh, what DeSantis most has to work on ahead of his presidential campaign. Susan, who do you like? Anybody else besides DeSantis? I mean, is there anybody else on your radar that you think has the chance it could take on the former president? I don't have anyone yet, but I am on the lookout because I do think that there is someone who can come in with that populist, but relatable, like Carla right. said, and, and has the right policy. So I think that there's potential. Okay, Susan, Carlos, thank you for calling in in that emergency mm -hmm. and suddenly getting in front of the camera. We appreciate that. Okay, from politics to the weather now, we want to turn to some snow and rain falling across the central U.S. Heavy rain soaking the plains with parts of Tennessee getting more than an inch and a half of rain. And this was the scene, check this out, out west in Montrose, Colorado, about 65 miles north of Telluride. 
Heavy snow making driving conditions difficult. Officials warning of potential avalanches across the state. Pretty early for that. I want to bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, walk us through what you're seeing over the next few days. Yeah, we've had a couple of minor storms this week, but then we're going to have a huge storm coming into the upcoming weekend. It's going to cause a lot of headaches right into the beginning of next week. So here's our next storm. It's coming through the Rockies. We just showed you some of the pictures of the snow. This is going to bring a little bit of rain and maybe isolated thunderstorms tonight and tomorrow into the central plains. Eventually, this will bring us some snow tomorrow night. The only people I have to worry about about it is in between Minneapolis and Des Moines. It looks like maybe about one to five inches in general, about two to three. So nothing huge, but it'll be a little slick. The West Coast has a one storm going through as we go to tomorrow. And then a huge one comes in Friday into Saturday. This one will be one that'll have the high winds with it. We'll get incredible amounts of snow in the high elevations, the rain at the low elevations, and this is gold. We've had a very active West Coast uh, period so far entering the rainy season, and this is exactly what we need. And these are the seven-day snowfall totals in the central Sierra. We're already well above average and we're going to add another three to five feet by monday the problem with this storm by the time we get into next week monday oklahoma including areas from oklahoma city to dallas to tulsa and then little rock southwards tom we're expecting another severe weather outbreak in the middle of december next week we should be talking tornadoes here come monday and tuesday okay i'm sure we'll be all over it also i want to ask you it is december but there's a disturbance <laughs> in the tropics yeah uh, this one was uh, a huge ocean storm and it's over warm enough water that it has a 50% chance the Hurricane Center is saying, yes, hurricane season ended the end of November, but we can get storms outside of that. So this is well off of Bermuda. It's out in the middle of the Atlantic. It's not going to affect anyone. But if it does become a subtropical or tropical system, the next name on the list, and I thought I was done with these, last one was Nicole. This would be Owen. Hopefully not, but it won't hit anyone. It's just kind of one of those head scratchers. It is almost Christmas time. In the O's. Okay, yeah. Bill Karens for us. Bill, we appreciate it. Still ahead tonight, air tag stalking fears. Two women suing Apple, claiming the devices that have become so popular enabled stalkers to follow and harass them. The steps you can take to use those tiny trackers safely. Plus, the joyride gone wrong, the crash that ignited a massive fireball at a gas station in New York, and the longest sentence yet just handed down in the Theranos fraud case. How much time Elizabeth Holmes' former boyfriend will spend behind bars? Stay with us. Back now with a new lawsuit against Apple's AirTag devices. Two women claiming the devices were used by their former partners to track them and that the devices can be dangerous when in the hands of stalkers. But this isn't the first time concerns have been raised over the safety of the product. Nyla Charles has the details. Tonight, two women suing Apple over its controversial AirTag devices, saying in the suit they fear for their safety, adding that their stalkers use AirTags to track, harass, and threaten them. Arguing the AirTag design is defective because it doesn't perform as safely as an ordinary consumer would have expected it to. It alleges that the AirTag is defectively designed, but the AirTag works exactly the way it's supposed to. What's happening is that bad people are misusing the AirTag. The class action lawsuit says plaintiff Lauren Hughes's ex-boyfriend started stalking her last year, leaving threatening voicemails and notes at her door. Scared, she moved out of her apartment. Hughes sharing her story on Good Morning America. I was actually loading things into my vehicle at the time when I got the notification that um, an air tag was moving with me. The lawsuit says she found an air tag lodged in the well of her tire and says police told her they could only read the stalker a cease and desist. The plaintiffs aren't alone in their concerns. I was being informed that there has been an air tag that has been following me since 5 o'clock. Kimberly Scroob told Top Story she got an air tag alert in January. My phone told me that there had been an air tag that had been following me. But she couldn't find it and said police wouldn't take a report. Uh, it's just scary. The lawsuit says Apple air tags are the weapons of choice for abusers and stalkers because they're more accurate than other tracking devices, easy to use with other Apple devices, and they're cheap, just $29. Check your belongings, check your surroundings. It was the scariest, scariest moment ever. Earlier this year, model Brooks Nader made this Instagram post saying she believes someone put an air tag into her jacket at a restaurant bar. NBC News hasn't been able to confirm Nader's account. Can Apple be held liable if someone chooses to use its product for a criminal action? Apple likely can't be held liable because bad actors use this product in a bad way, especially because it appears Apple has taken a lot of steps 
to notify people when there's an AirTag traveling with them. When reached out for comment, Apple directed us to a statement released in February that said in part, we condemn in the strongest possible terms any malicious use of our products. The company also said it made AirTag updates, including privacy warnings, unwanted tracking alerts, and the ability to locate an AirTag if there is unwanted tracking. All right, Nyla Charles joins us now from Los Angeles. So, Nyla, as you mentioned in the piece there, there are other tracking devices out there, but it applies to AirTags being questioned here, the lawsuit. Is it the popularity or is it that the tracking abilities there are in question? It's both, Tom. Air tags are so accurate because they use Bluetooth technology to send a signal to Apple devices for a location. Think of it like a cell phone, but instead of pinging a cell tower for a location, it pings Apple devices. Apple says the entire process is anonymous and encrypted. Nearly 49% of people in the country have iPhones, so it's the popularity that makes the tracking technology so strong. Tom? Okay, Nyla Charles, we thank you for that report, and it's not just Apple that's under fire over privacy privacy problems. More states now expressing concern over social media giant TikTok with one even suing the company. We're going to tell you about that, citing child safety issues. And you may have seen those popular AI generated portraits are all over Instagram, right? They're all over every social media, to be honest with you. But some security experts are saying, be careful what you post. For more on this topic, I want to bring in NBC News tech reporter Dave Ingram, who joins us now. Dave, the stories we just heard are very alarming, but the reality is air tags are small, they're inexpensive. What are some of the ways Apple can actually prevent bad actors from using them, or can they? Yeah, well, you mentioned some of the changes that they've made uh, back in February of this year. That happened after there were already some cases of stalking and also carjackings, cars being stolen or other types of misuse of these products. Apple added a couple features to try to prevent bad actors from using air tags in this way. So you'll be, people who um, who may be stalked can see on their they may get on their phone some alert that they're uh, that there's an air tag traveling with them. They also uh, fine tuned the ability or or the a feature that that has the air tag beep under certain certain circumstances when it's not near the owner, and that you know can eventually allow the person who is being stalked to disable the air tag uh, when it's when it's near them. Dave, let's turn to TikTok now. Several states, including Maryland and Texas, banning government employees from using TikTok on work devices, citing security concerns. Now, Indiana is suing the company for child security and safety violations, claiming the app exposes them to mature content. Other social media companies have faced scrutiny about data protection, even the type of content. But, but should the average user be concerned about TikTok? Yeah, I, th I think the, the short answer is yes, the average user should be concerned anytime they're using either TikTok or any other social media app that collects your personal information, uh, whether it is asking for your contacts, whether it is tracking your, um, how, I mean, they, they are tracking how often you log in, often your location. Uh, the fact is that, that whether it's TikTok or any other app on your phone, there are uh, all kinds of data, either directly about you, personal information or location data, metadata, that can be personal and of nature. And using any of these apps, we should all be aware that we are compromising to some degree our uh, our privacy. Finally, I want to ask you about those portraits people have been probably been posting all over social media. Some people have been seeing them. There are so many of them. We've seen, uh, this is one, I want to show you an example of what they look like. Yeah, they're pretty incredible. That's MJ Rodriguez, then Chance the Rapper, Marvel star Simu Liu is there as well. And those are portraits that are all, all AI generated. They're pretty impressive. The app creates them based on photos you submit, but some security experts have raised concerns about this app. Is it really different than using Face ID on an, on an app, for example? This is one of those things that sort of, you know, people have to think about the balance between how fun these apps can be and, and they, they create pretty cool images, but but also um, we can never be certain how this data is being used, right? So uh, some Lenza, one of these companies says that they have, they're deleting all these images, uh, anything you submit or anything they produce within 24 hours. But of course that's not being audited by any third party. And the pat there's sort of a patchwork regulation in the United States to protect us uh, when we're online. There is no federal comprehensive data privacy law. And until there is one, any app like this or, or TikTok or any other app on our phones is going to collect some data with, with really only a self-regulatory scheme. And Dave, real quick, just, just the danger there for that last app that's doing those portraits that everyone is using, it would be essentially you're submitting your photo to an app that you have no idea who runs this app. 
Yeah, uh, you have no idea who runs it. They're, they're new companies. They may say, and some of them do say, I've read some of their privacy policies, um, that they delete their, uh, the photos you submit uh, within 24 hours or sooner, that you still own the rights to your photo. You're not turning over the intellectual property rights. But again, um, you're, there's a certain amount of trust that is uh, going on and that you have to have in order to um, feel assured that this data is not going to be misused. So it does come down to how much you trust that particular company. Okay, Dave Ingram, thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. Coming up next, an update on the death of mobster Whitey Bulger, the new report just released by the Department of Justice. What they say led to the crime boss's 2018 murder in a West Virginia prison. Stay with us. All right, we're back now with Top Story's news feed, and we begin with new details on the death of notorious crime boss Whitey Bulger. The Justice Department releasing a scathing new report finding, quote, gross incompetence led to the mobster's murder in a West Virginia prison in 2018. Bolger was killed by fellow inmates just 12 hours after he arrived at one of the most violent prisons in the nation. According to the report, inmates had been tipped off about Bolger's impending transfer, though no evidence of malicious intent or improper motive was uncovered. Okay, now to the major explosion caught on camera at a gas station in upstate New York. New surveillance footage shows a driver doing burnouts at a Rochester gas station or donuts when he slams right into a gas pump. That pump then erupting into a fireball and causing a fire. Luckily, no one was hurt somehow. That 18-year-old was arrested. An update tonight in the Theranos scandal. The company's former COO, Ramesh Sunny Balwani, sentenced to nearly 13 years in prison for fraud. He and his former partner, Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes, were found guilty of deceiving patients and investors. During their time at the failed blood testing company, Holmes was sentenced to more than 11 years in prison last month. Balwani is expected to surrender to authorities in March. More cowbell, of course. Yes, that's Will Ferrell on stage giving a nod to that memorable SNL skit from 2000. The comedian joining his son Magnus for a concert benefiting Cancer for College. The organization started by one of the famous actor's friends, award scholarships to cancer survivors in college. And now we return to a story we've been covering closely on Top Story, that tragic and gruesome murder of four students at the University of Idaho. Police today removing some personal belongings of the victims from the house where they were stabbed. Steve Patterson is there and brings us the latest developments. Tonight, it's finals week at the University of Idaho, but the campus is eerily quiet. The still unsolved quadruple murder has students and their parents back home on edge. There's not very many people who have been going to classes. They often opt for virtual classes because they might feel safer in their homes or they don't feel safe commuting to campus, especially with um, the sunset happening so early now around four o'clock. When journalism major Katerina Hakama does venture out, she's alert and prepared. My roommate bought me a pepper spray that I keep on my keychain now. It's because no suspect has been publicly identified. No weapon has been found as police continue the complicated investigation. Today, police going to the site of the gruesome murders to box up and return the victim's personal effects to their families. Hopefully to help with some of their healing. But the victim's families are fed up. They say the police haven't been transparent and have been given conflicting accounts of what happened. The father of one of the victims, Kayla Gonzalez, telling Fox News he's hiring a lawyer and private private investigator to, quote, get the truth faster. Let's stop playing games, guys. I need somebody to step up and be an alpha, be somebody to be a leader. But experts tell NBC News it could take weeks to analyze DNA evidence and fingerprints, especially in a house with a lot of roommates and friends coming and going. Meanwhile, there's a glaring five-hour gap in the timeline of events surrounding two of the victims who authorities say were last seen at a party at this frat house the night before. Officials say they left the party around 8 or 9 o'clock, but aren't placed at their home until 1.45 a.m., even though it's only about a block between the fraternity and the crime scene. Yeah, Tom, a big break in this case could come with the release of a full autopsy report. The problem is we don't know when that would be released or if it will be released to the public as this investigation is ongoing. What we do know is that police, citing the coroner's office, indicate that all the victims were asleep at the time that the stabbing occurred. However, that there were defensive wounds as well, which also indicates that there was a fight, that some of the victims may have fought back. Meanwhile, local, state, federal officials all working in concert to try to find some scrap of evidence or anything that could push this investigation forward. Tom? Okay, Steve Patterson on the ground for us. Steve, we appreciate it. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the deadly bombing at a police station in Indonesia. 
Authorities say the bomber entered the station with a motorcycle and blew himself up. The attack killing at least one officer and injuring 11 others. Police say the bomber was part of a group with ties to ISIS. He had been released from prison last year after serving time for funding terrorism and bomb making. In Spain, the search for more than a dozen people after a scheme to force an emergency landing. A commercial plane carrying more than 228 passengers from Turkey to Morocco when a woman said she was going into labor. When the plane landed in Barcelona, at least 28 people took off across the tarmac. Half of them arrested by police, but the other half are still on the run. Authorities say a similar situation happened last October in Mallorca. And goodbye airplane mode, at least in the European Union. They say they will allow airline passengers to make calls in flight. The 27-country bloc telling its member nations they have until next June to assign 5G frequencies for planes. EU officials say the new policy would provide new services to passengers and help companies grow. Experts say the move could lead to a similar rule change here in the U.S. Finally tonight, home for the holidays. A little girl in Arkansas hadn't seen her army dad in nearly a year. But when the school mascot paid a random visit to her classroom, she ended up getting a hug she's been waiting for. Wait till you see the moment. Down in Little Rock, Arkansas, a big surprise. Seven-year-old Kaylin Martinus, the daughter of an Army Staff Sergeant, thinking she's about to be interviewed on TV. My dad's in the Army. Answering questions about the sacrifices military families make and what it's like not to have dad by her side every day. How much do you miss him? So much. She told them how her dad is her hero. Staff Sergeant Carl Martinus. He's been overseas serving in Iraq for nearly a year. The last time I got to see him, we hugged each other goodbye. And she's been holding on to the memory of that hug for 11 months, only able to speak to him through FaceTime. While I was over there, we would do, uh, you know, act like I'm a hug the, the phone. But to do the real thing, it's, it, there's nothing you can, uh, that describes the feeling and it means everything, it means the world. But what Caitlin didn't know is that initial TV interview wasn't real at all. All part of an elaborate surprise that involved her dad coming home and posing as the school mascot on that same day. Yeah. Little Caitlin getting the surprise of her life. What did you think when uh, I showed up in the, in the costume? Well, at first I didn't know it was you, but then when you took your mask off, I was surprised that was you. Staff Sergeant Martinus granted leave, allowed to return home early for the holidays, and now making up for lost time. When they first leave, it kind of feels like it's been a long time, but when you finally get back, then it'll feel like you have just came from yesterday both appreciating this priceless gift, arriving right on time. I missed you. I missed you too. Such an incredible moment. We thank Army Staff Sergeant Marty News for his service and for sharing that moment. And we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.